Okay, guys, so what I want to start with, first of all, is, is um, what I got in front of me is this is what's called the contract template. Now, what that is is the State Procurement Bureau, every time you do a contract, they have what's called a template that they put all the information into. So what I'm showing you here is our State Procurement Contract Template. And the reason I start here is it's basically a Word document that when we get to contract stage where we're going to um, – get into contract negotiations or to establish a contract with the contractor, we pull up this Word document and we fill in all the information um, that applies to the contract that we're trying to establish. So all Emacs is, is we still use this particular document in the Emacs environment as well. The only thing that's additional when you're going into Emacs is some of the information that's in this Word document is actually taken out of the Word document put into the Emacs environment in certain fields so they can be reported on. So a lot of people, you know, get nervous when they've got to learn a new system, but um, it's essentially all the information when you go to enter what I'm going to call an active contract. That's a contract that you currently have established now that's already been executed in effect and it's been signed by both parties. When you go to enter those contracts into the Emacs environment, you're basically taking – this Word document, probably saved as a PDF, and you're taking the information from this document and you're entering it into fields in Emacs. So that's really all Emacs is. You're probably used to, and I hope you're used to, the terminology that comes with contracts, first party, second party, start date, end date, term, so on and so forth. My assumption is you know those, that terminology because it's going to be helpful if you know that and be successful to entering a contract into TCM. So most agencies have a template similar to this. Most agencies uh, have these stored electronically somewhere in some kind of system or on their S drive or whatever the case may be. So that, that's a good first step when you go to enter your active contracts is you have a contract template that's like this, that's completed, it's executed in effect, and it's stored electronically. So I always start with the template part of it because we'll, we'll use this through this demonstration. Any questions on that? Okay, so I'll move on. Um, in the, the actual... Um, second here. Uh, I'm going to get to the screen. Okay, on... In the actual meeting, I, I did send you a, a link. What we have is in that link is we, we have what's called single sign-on. So when you click on that link, it actually uh, recognizes you based on your C number or your, your um, Active Directory credentials. And it actually click on that link, you log in, and you get this screen that I'm showing you right now. This is our Emacs test environment. So there's really no um, credentials to log in. We have what's called single sign-on, which is attached to Active Directory. And that's how we set you up. We provide you that link. You click on the link, you get right into the Emacs environment. Um, we, we do have two different environments. We have what's called the test environment. You can see up here, this is the actual test environment. It's also red in color. Our production environment looks the same. There may be some differences. There's some stuff in test that we're still testing that aren't in production. But for the most part, it looks the same. It functions the same way. But the production environment is blue in color, and it will not have this test environment. So that's how we distinguish between the two environments. You can be in both environments at the same time. It's just, you just cannot be in under the same browser. So for an example, I have two different browsers that I use. I use Edge. I log into the test environment using Edge, and then I'll log into our production environment using Chrome or Google. So Keep that in mind if you're in the same browser in both environments things are going to start breaking and that's because it's not set up that way you have to be in, in two separate browsers so when you land on this page in the test environment um the other thing that let me just do a quick overview of what other um modules are available in the emacs environment this right here is called the landing page is called our emacs marketplace so you can see right here we have a home page we have the Emacs Marketplace. The Emacs Marketplace is where we um, shop from our term contracts. You can see 360, 
Um, Munchen Moon Brush doesn't have a contract anymore, but Staples, we have um, Granger, Fast and All. So our marketplace allows us to search from punch out catalogs that we have term contracts with. Um, those people that shop from these catalogs, they have the ability to go search for their orders. So we have an order section. We have a contract section, which we're going to cover today. We do have an accounts payable section, but it came with the suite of, of goods for this platform. But the record for the state of Montana is our savers. You'll be able to select them as a party on the contract. And you're going to see that uh, in this presentation. We also have a sourcing module. That's where we do all our bids. Um, not every state agency uses the sourcing part of it, um, but for those that do, they can start their, their bid, do the bid in the system, then they can hook the bid to the actual contract so you have it all linked in the system so you can get to all your records by going to either the sourcing event or the contract and get to either or. And then we have a, a, some re reporting modules that um, some of you will use, but the reporting in TCM I'll show you at a, at a, at a later time. So that's Emacs as a whole. Um, any questions on that? I mean, it's, it's, you guys can log into test when you get in there and you can go in there and look at those other modules. They're all role-based. You may not have access to all of them, but so Emacs is a all-in-one. Encompasses try to do the, the full procurement process from the requisition all the way to the contract. So that's how our system set up for, for, for e-procurement. Any questions on that? Okay. So the other part of this training is why, why we offer this training is um, it allows you to, you'll be able to use this recording, but it also allows people that attend um, this training, it allows you to, to take the train the trainer approach. So how we do our implementations is we train division heads or AOs or whatever, you know, however your structure is broken down with your division under your agency. We train those people that allows them to train new people that come on board that may need access to the module. So we take the train, the trainer approach. I just wanted to let you guys know that. So you taking this training and learning how to do this, it would allow you to, um, train some new people that, that come on board that actually need to, to learn how the system works and how to enter contracts into TCM. So let's start with the contract part of it. Um, when you hover over contracts, you get a, either one of these modules, you get a bunch of options when you hover over them. I'm just going to do these kind of high level. Go under contracts, you have the contracts home. If you click on that, it goes to home page that breaks down all the contracts in the system. You can search for contracts. You can have saved searches on contracts. You can search your contract attachments. There's where we're going to create a new contract. Export templates, that's a little higher level thing. I'll try to cover that at the end. Contract parties, that's the first and second party in the system. And if you import or export things in the system, you can click on here and it'll show you the results. The approval section. Um, right now, we don't have what's called approval workflow enabled in our production site. So I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but um, I know your uh, contract manager is very interested in applying this approvals to the contracts that you enter. I will show you briefly in this presentation what it's about, but currently it's not enabled. But you do have the ability to enter a contract, have it go to, oh, I don't know, say your chief of staff or your agency procurement officer or your administrative officer first before it actually, and each one of those people have to approve it before it actually gets executed in effect. So it does have that ability. That's not currently enabled in production, but we do have the ability to enable that. And I think your CO is looking at that your contract manager. Reports, I will come back to this. I'll show you the reports. I really, um, it's a very high, high powerful reporting feature in here. This is what we use, especially with legislative session coming up. We'll get a lot of um, calls from senators or representatives and they'll want reporting on our contract. So this system has the ability to pull reports. You can do a search and pull it into an Excel spreadsheet and share that data with who's ever asking about it. So it does have a reporting feature. And then the request part of it, this is part of where we enter what's called a sole source request. Sole source 
for those of you that may not know what that is, it's a request sent to State Procurement Bureau that they um, only have a sole contractor that can provide this good and services. So they, they want to skip the actual procurement solicitation process and go right to contract. So when you guys submit what's called the sole source to STB, they either approve it or deny it, and then it goes right to contracts. So those are the, the um, actual sections of the contracts that we're going to cover today. And in the presentation, we'll, we'll hit each one of these um, as we go through the presentation. Reporting will be done at the very end of it. Any questions so far? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you guys the process of how you would enter a contract that's already active. What I mean by active is it's already executed, it's already signed, it's a contract that you're performing goods and services, the contractor's performing goods and services underneath that contract. So when you go into the production environment, you're going to have somewhere saved an electronic copy of that contract. So the process I'm going to show you now is the process where you would enter an active contract that's already, um, like I said, already executed, and you have a, a PDF copy of that contract. So how you, would get, how you would do that is you would go to these contracts, under contracts, and you're going to create a new contract. This pop-up window comes up. Every contract has a name. You would enter the contract name in here. And again, where you're going to get all this information is you're going to have your PDF contract document handy. You're just going to take the information off of that document and you're going to enter it into these fields. I'm just going to select test for now. Contract type. All this is is a reporting feature in the system. So when you select contract type, you can see right here, we believe here at SDB we've covered every contract type that, that every state agency may use. You can see there's grants agreements, leases, master contracts, purchase orders, so on and so forth, service contracts. Standard contract is mainly the main one. You just have to remember when you go to into your contracts, what kind of contract type are you entering? Is it a subgrant? Is it a term contract? Is it a standard contract? Is it a sole source? So you've got to decide what type of contract that is, and you would select it here. So I'm just going to do standard contract for now and click Save Changes. Now two other fields automatically populate. I put myself under Department of Justice Information Technology Services. They call this the work group, where it essentially it's another name for your agency. So when you're going into production, what we do behind the scenes is we set you up under certain work groups or agencies. So when you go to create your contracts, you automatically put in the correct agency. Main document template, um, this is a functionality that we don't use. At the beginning of this presentation, I showed you guys what a, a template looks like. The issue with the state of Montana is not everybody uses the same template. So we don't use this functionality in Emacs. If everybody had the same template, we could pull in that template here and we could use that template for all contracts. But since we have so many different templates for so many different agencies. This is a functionality that we don't use. You can see it's not a required field. There's no star next to it. So after we enter this information, we can just click on create contract. Now we are in the actual contract document, but I want to make sure nobody has any questions up to this point. Okay, so what we're going to do here is eventually all these sections down here will, are going to have a green check mark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to each one of these sections, very high level. Um, we'll start with the header section, but before we get into that, I'm going to show you essentially some of the functions that allow you to enter this contract and why they're, hap why they're happening. So above here, every... Every contract has a certain status. You can see this one's in draft status. I'm going to go to this next screen. These are all the different types of statuses that you're going to see in Emacs. Some of them are 
self-explanatory or complete, that means the contract's done. We're in draft status. There's two different executes, future and, and execute is in effect. That's based on the starting and end date. Expired is a status. Internal and external review. I will show those in the presentation. That's where you're sending the contract to somebody for review of the language that's in the contract before you actually send it out for signature. Out for signature is the dot you sign um, status. It shows you that it's out for signature electronically through DocuSign. If we had the approvals that I talked about, they would go to these statuses, pending approval or pending signature. If you reject a contract, it's going to go to the rejected status. Every time you create a new contract from an existing contract, the existing contract gets superseded and the new one will be executed in effect. And then you can also terminate a contract. So those are the contract statuses that we have available in the system. And right now, this one is in draft status. On the other side, there's a contracts actions button. If you do this drop down, these are the functions you can perform on a contract. What's, what happens? The first one is this check in, check out. So let me just get out of this for a minute. You can see right here it says this contract's currently checked out to me. It is locked. It cannot be edited by others until you check it in. So you can see I have the ability to put stuff in fields because I have this contract checked out. As soon as I go to check it back in, you can see it locks all the fields, and now I can't change anything. So what you have to remember when you're entering your contracts here is you make a change, you check it out, you actually make that change. In order for that change to take effect, you have to check it back in again. So you have the check in, check out. That's when you're making changes, check it out, make the change, check it back in, it saves the change. Because we're in draft status, it's automatically checked out. You also have that contract action underneath here, check in as well. Sign contract facilitator is a functionality we're testing. You won't see that on the production site. You can see I can terminate this contract. I can archive this contract. I can copy this contract. I can delete this contract. These other three um, down here have to do what's called the communication center. I will cover those in, in the latter part of the presentation, but it's a different functionality that's kind of cool. You can um, house your communication from your vendors back and forth within this contract record. So the other thing that's up here is it gives you a bunch of warnings. You know, once you're, you get through all your um, fields, all of these will, will actually be They'll disappear as you um, enter information in the field. Um, let me just go through this real quick. The system automatically assigns a, what's called a numbering wheel. So it automatically signs that number. Um, here's this name of this came over from the pop-up window until I selected standard contract and put the type here. I don't have a second party yet, but as soon as I do that, it will be populated here. This is nor, uh, not a renewal or an amendment. This is an original one. If you guys are going to track spend, you can see it here, and I will show you that when we get to that section. And then upload main document. You can do it here, but we do it in a different section, and I'll show you why we do it in that actual section. So, and again, I, I explained it down here. We're going to go through each one of these step by step. Um, so I'll stop right there and make sure nobody has any questions to this point. Okay, so let's start with the contract header. You can see every field that's required has a star on it. So I talked about the number, contract number. It automatically um, assigns a number based on the work group or the agency that's in there. You have the ability to edit that number. So obviously, your active contract, this is not going to be the number in your active contracts. You can actually edit that field and put your existing contract number. The contract name, again, came over from the setup, but if, a, if it's something different, you can edit that field as well. Contract type, if it, you don't think it's a standard one, again, what you can do here is get rid of that and go back in there again and select, well, this is a term contract, not a standard contract. 
And then the work group is, it looks like it's editable, but when you go there, you're only going to have that option because that's the part of the work group or the division within DOJ that you, you have. So it looks like it's editable, but if I was to go in there and get rid of that and go search for it, it's only going to give me that option. Um, summary, it is a required field. What this section does is it allows people to actually go look at the contract record, and rather than have to go look at the, the document to see what the contract's all about, we tell people to do a brief summary in here. Contract is for whatever. So then when you save that, the person that's looking at it, rather than having to go upload or, or look at the main document to find out what the contract's about, they can look at this summary and say, oh, okay, now I know what this contract's for. Um, we always suggest people put some kind of summary in there that's going to make sense to people to learn what the contract's about. Um, parent contract. This has the ability, the system has the ability to do what's called parent-child contracts. The example I can give you is the State Procurement Bureau has a master IT contract for master services, IT services. We actually enter that contract in DCM. It's a contract that we own. But agencies, it's, it's called a term contract where agencies can negotiate their own contract underneath that term contract, and they have the ability to enter that contract because it's a different agreement. If that was the case, our contract would be the parent. You would search for that. And this contract here would be a child to that parent. Now, not every contract that you enter has that. So I'm just showing you it, it doesn't um, apply to all the contracts that we enter, but there are some where there's a parent-child where you have the parent contract and you have a different agreement underneath that, and that contract's the child contract. Not a required field, so you don't really have to do anything there if it doesn't apply. Internal contract status, you can see here, this was added for one of the agencies. Um, they wanted the ability to change the status of a contract. If I was to put expired here, it doesn't do anything to the contract record. The true status is this status over here that we talked about already. So uh, most agencies won't use this field. It's not required. I wouldn't put anything in there. Next thing right here is really, really important section of your contract. It's e-signature. E-signature is the DocuSign feature that I talked about earlier. This allows you to upload your contract and it through DocuSign for electronic signature. Now we're doing an active contract that's already signed. So the default on this is no. In this scenario, we want to leave it at no. If it's a contract that's brand new that needs to be signed, you would click this to yes, and just let me just save this so I can show you what happens. As soon as I save this, you can see over here, it now gives me an e-signature section. We're going to show this in the amendment in the renewal process, but I, I just want to show you that now that I have this as yes, it's going to allow me to add signers to it and send it to DocuSign. But since this is an active contract, whoops, sorry about that. Since this is an active contract, I'm going to put no because it's already signed, and I'm going to save progress here, and you'll see that e-signature piece goes away. So the first thing you really want to remember when you're entering your contracts is no, it does not need to be signed, or yes, it does need to be signed. So you'll have to remember that when you go to enter your contracts. Now, your active ones, the default will always be at no. Um, show on vendor portal. This is something that we're testing in the test environment. Um, it allows the ability for the vendor to log into their portal to get a copy of the contract. Um, we're just testing it in production. It's not active, so you can just forget that actual field. Just leave it at the default. And that's the contract header section. I want to make sure nobody has any um, Questions on that? Change this back to. Let's say that progress. There we go. Any questions on the contract header? Okay, we're going to go down to contract parties. Every contract has a party, 
can see right here, there's a warning that your contract must have primary or second party. When you guys go to enter your contract, this first party is already automatically populated. If you need to add an additional first party, you can click on here. You can search for that party and add an additional party. So you can have a first party primary and an additional first party, same with the second party. Second party primary and additional second party. Um, these two buttons over here, it allows you to edit the party or delete the party. Edit the party, you can see it doesn't have a contact, so you have the ability to go in here and edit the contact. What we do when we move you to production is we add these people so you can just select them. I'll just select Dylan there, and then I want to edit the address. Once we move you to production, we automatically load all this information and when you come into production, all you have to do is select it. And you can have multiple contact addresses. You can have multiple contacts. So that's something that we talk about when we move you from test to production. We'll say, hey, who do you want added here behind the scenes so you can select it? You don't have to know all of them up front. As you're entering contracts and more people come on board, you just got to reach out to the help desk and request to have a first-party contact and a first-party contact address added and we can add it behind the scenes. So that's the first party. You can see your contract must have a primary or second party. This is where I talked about the vendor registration part. If the vendor is not registered in the system, you won't have the ability to search for that vendor and add them as a second party. But if they're in there, all you do is you add second party. You search for it. I'm just going to do to the abuse. Do a search, it actually comes up. I can select it. I can select a contact. And I can select an address. Now we have a second party. So again, this is all reliant on the vendor actually registering in the system. When they register in this vendor module, like I told you, it comes over, it allows us to search them, pull them into a contract record as a second party. So they enter all this information under their vendor record in the vendor module. If the vendor is not there, then yeah, basically you got to stop and um, you, you can't enter your actual contract. You got to stop because there's no way to add that second party. So in our implementation, what we did at the beginning is we made sure we went into the production site, took a list of the vendors, and we made sure that they were in there, so when you go to enter your contract, you're not stalled right here. So I can't move on because the vendor is not registered. I'll stop right there. Any questions on parties? Again, you can have additional first and second parties as well. I think you can add up to two first parties and two second parties. Sometimes leases, you know, uh, General Services does leases for the state of Montana agencies they'll have additional first and second parties because um, that's what they do on leases. But you have the ability to do it as well if it applies to your contract. Questions? Okay. Let's go down to dates and renewals. Every, you know me as well as I do. Every date, every contract has a start date and end date. We have the time zone defaulted to our time zone. Start date, you can actually search for it. Obviously, you can go back when your active contract started. I'm just going to go December 1st on this one. Um, end date. Tomorrow on this one. Now, the ability here, if you selected this update, update start date upon execution, what that does is you still have to put a date in here. But what this does is as soon as it goes through DocuSign and it's all signed, at that point, whatever date it's signed, it comes back here and it updates the start date to that time. So some people use that, some people don't. I mean, if, if your contract says the start date is upon execution, you want to use this functionality. You would check that, still put a date in here. Once it went through DocuSign, everybody signed it, it would come back here and update that date because now that's the execution date that everything was signed. I don't suggest putting contracts 
that have no expiration. I know they exist, but if you select no expiration on, a, on your contract, it's going to affect the way you do amendments and renewals. Now, you may have a contract that doesn't have an expiration date, but I'm suggesting to you at least make your contracts that have no expiration date, at least have them go a year because it'll send you a notification that, hey, you still have this contract. And if something needs to be changed, you have the ability to change it if you put an end date on it. If you put no expiration date, the record cannot be changed. Um, review date, review term, reviews remaining. These aren't required fields. You do have the ability to use these fields. Um, SPD hardly uses these fields, but an example of where you might use this is if you have a contract that you need to review six months every it goes for a year. Every six months, you want to review it. You can put a review date in there. You can select the term six months, and you can do it as many times as you want that to happen to the life of the contract. So they're not required fields. I'm not going to put anything in there, but you do have the ability to review these on a certain term, however many times you want to do it, and on a certain date. On the other side, I always suggest put renewals remaining. Most contracts run seven years. ITs run... 10 years, so this would have six remaining. Um, automatically applied price files. This is a system that um, assumes that every contract that you enter can be shopped from. Well, we know that isn't true. Um, so we always leave the default to no because it doesn't have a price file. The term I always put in here, um, this one right here will be renewed every year. And auto renew, we leave to no because we want the ability to either renew it manually or not renew it. Uh, then I'll click save progress. You can see the header section still doesn't have a green check mark because these other two sections are going to have to be completed first before we get all green check marks. And I'll, I'll show you how that works. So that's the first page of the contract header. Again, most of this information that you ha I have here is going to come from the PDF document electronic that I already have saved. Any questions on anything on this first page before we move on? Okay, so you can save progress and you can go next here or you can go next up here. Either one will do it. You want to make sure you save progress just like a Word document. If you don't save progress before you move on, it won't save it. So let's go next. It's going to bring us to the custom contract information. A lot of information here. In a nutshell, what this is, is this is what um, we use for reporting, most of it. This is most of what legislators or the public or the governor or somebody wants to know about the contract. So most of these fields in here are required fields. Some of them aren't. If you have a project manager, you can put project manager in there. What we've done in both test and production, if you're not sure what's supposed to go in that field, that's what all these little question marks are for. You click on that, it'll give you an idea of what we're looking for or what you should put in that field if it applies to your contract. So I'm not going to do the fields that are non-required, but existing contract, yes, this is an existing contract. These next two fields are not in production. It's something that we're testing so you can just put no to those. We're trying to automate the renewal process, and we're testing it in tests. So um, I'll just do no on those. So we want to know the original contract fiscal year. Absolute end date. People get confused on what an absolute end date is. Indicate the max end date of this contract if all renewals occur. So um, it's 2022. I said there were six renewals. So obviously the absolute end date is going to be 2028. So I would go to 2028 and I would select the correcting ending date. Is in my header, I said it had six renewals. So we got to make sure everything matches here. Again, you're going to get this from the contract electronic copy as well. Exclusive contract, um, that applies to SPD most of the time. So probably no on that one. IT contract, this one isn't. If it's yes, we ask you to put in the ITPR number. I'll say no. Total contract value. Total value of the contract if all applicable renewals are filled. So this goes six more times. We want 
that value put in here. So I'm just going to put like six. We'll just put something in there, but you would do the math, thousand dollars. You can put some details in here if you want about that total contract value. The current contract term amount, again, this is a contract that's going for a year. It's the original one. We have six more renewals. So we would take the 6,000 and divide that by six. So this is worth 1,000. So again, this is all gonna be on your document. You just basically draft in that information and put it in these custom fields. Usage type, three different ones you can select there. Funding source, you have some options there. Cooperative purchasing, no. Montana vendor, we get a lot of calls. People, hey, give me a list of all your contracts that have been awarded to a, to a Montana vendor. That's why we have this field. So I'll just select yes. Category codes, this is another way to report on your contracts. Um, so these are high level. You can see there's clothing, there's construction, there's food, there's fuel and energy, general supplies. When you're entering your contracts, you want to find another way to separate them all to pull a report. So you can do it on this field that's called category codes. You have to do with prevailing wage applies. I don't know any of these things. I rely on what we put in here as far as what I'm going to select on the field. Um, I'm not a financial person, but um, we do have help text here. So retainage, I'm going to say it doesn't apply. Gross receipt tax, I'm going to say no. Liquidated damage, I'm going to say no. Contract security, I'm going to say none. The last two fields are fields that you can put additional information to actually separate out your contracts. The example that SPB does is we collect all on our term contracts. Some we collect what's called admin fees, some we don't. We want to be able to pull a report based on what contracts have admin fees, what contracts don't. So what we put in this field, we put admin fee, either yes or no. That's just an example. It's not a required field. If you want to separate out your contract some other way from all the other ones that you enter, you can use this custom field. Then you would click Save Progress. Um, you can see I got a green check mark. Everything in this field, in this section that ha that was required has been entered. I'll stop there. Any questions on that? And again, you guys, you guys will have access to this test environment. You know, as soon as I'm done with all this, you can go in there and play around. It is a test environment. You can't really break anything. I can tell you, though, the emails that come from the test environment is, is a true, actual, live email. So, for example, if you're sending an email from the communication center to your vendor, it's going to go live to him. So when you're doing testing in the test environment, you want to keep those emails, you know, close to your group. So they know it's, I mean, the test email shows that it's a test email, but you don't want to create confusion when you're testing with your vendors. Hey, Tom, I have a I'm question. Gonna go, you betcha. Go ahead. Um, are any of these, um, are, is this like a, sta is this standard for Emacs? Like there's no way to customize it for a specific division, correct? Well, like removes, we, we, remove some of these fields that maybe we don't think, you know, or necessarily need to have or have to have. Okay, so what we, during the, you know, when you guys get done with your testing, if you find a need, you can present that to me. I can see if there is or there isn't. There may be, I don't want to say yes, I don't want to say no to that without actually knowing the actual situation. But I, I can tell you adding stuff might, might be a little more difficult than removing stuff that doesn't apply. Because we could, we could go into this um, and go to the contract type, like say, for example, a grant. Some of these might not apply to a grant. We can hide them so you don't have to enter them. So that's the example I want to give you. But um, I would need, you know, a scenario, more information on that, whether I would say yes or no. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Yeah. So when you're done with all your testing, you know, when you're, you, you come to me and say, hey, you know, we found this. Is, is it possible to change this or that? And then we can determine it based on that. Yeah, well, I, I think what, what flagged me to that was when you select yes for IT contract and then it um, brings in a fillable field to put in the ITPR number. So like mm -hmm. for so Department of Justice, we, we still do ITPRs internally, but 
in most situations, we're not required to have those submitted through State Procurement Bureau anymore. And so we don't get that ITPR number anymore. And so okay. we wouldn't necessarily have anything to put in there. Okay, so it does take, okay, so it's not a field that's a numeric. Okay, all right, yeah, perfect. I would, yeah, I would do that because um, well, what we need is we, we want to report if it's an IT contract or not. Just as, if right. it doesn't apply, that's what you do. You can, you have the ability to do that. So again, it goes okay. back to once you're done with all your testing, you know, we can look at those scenarios and see if there's a workaround. Perfect, thank you. You bet. Anybody else have any other questions before I move on? Okay, my goal is trying to get through this and you know, once we, we should be able to get through this, oh, I guess in the next 25, 30 minutes and we can take a quick break after that. But let me move on. So then we go to insurance. Um, we do have an insurance section. Every contract has insurance. If the insurance does, doesn't apply, you can just select no insurance required and click save progress. But if you do have insurance, you have the ability to select the type. We believe we've covered all of them here. If there is something that isn't here, you have the ability to select other. But when you select the insurances, you would fill in begin date ex based on what type of insurance, begin date, expiration date, the limits. Um, let's see if the CGL is the most common one. Yeah, you'd put a start date, an end date. If that's the only one I have, then I'd go to my additional insurance. I'd say no additional insurance. But this right here is just basically a reminder that you want to upload the insurance document to the attachment section. I'll show you how we do that. So we just it's just a reminder. Say, hey, now that you enter the insurance, if you have the document, let's upload it to the attachment section. I'll show you how to do that. So I'll just select yes there and click save progress. But we have the ability to enter as many insurances that apply. Um, I haven't seen many records that have more than five, but if you run across that issue, I, we have a workaround where if you have more than five insurances that apply to this contract, we have a workaround. So you can see the header section is now green. So is the custom contract information and so is the insurance. So it's telling me that everything that's been required in those three sections I've entered data and it, it, we're good to go so far. Any questions? Okay, we'll keep moving along. Um, commodity codes, this isn't a required section, but if you do a sourcing event and you tie it to a contract, on the sourcing event, there's what's called commodity codes. This is another way to um, separate out your contracts based on commodity codes. You can see we have 515 of them. You can select a code. I'll just select one here. If this commodity code applies to this contract, this again, when you go to search for this contract, you can search all by commodity code, all contracts that have agricultural chemicals on it, it'll bring them up. So it helps with the reporting. It's not a required section. Some people use it, some people don't. Um, just another way to separate out your contracts. Again, it's not required, you can skip right by it, but that's how you would actually do it. Um, we use it on the sourcing part of it because the sourcing codes come over to the contract when we tie both of those two together. So it helps for reporting. Alternative language, I'm just gonna skip right over, but it is just that. We have the ability to do this in multiple languages. I haven't had a need for that yet. So the section I can't hide as you can see, there's no requirements in that actual section. Attachment section, this is where our goal in EMAPS is to have a free contract record based on our contract management policy training. So what you can do in this section is you, anything that pertains to this um, contract, and it's an attachment, you can attach it here. The first thing that we're going to do is this is an active contract. We're gonna upload our main document template. When you click on that, brings up a window. Um, I'm gonna add my own. I'm gonna go select my file. I'm going out to my electronic um, section where I house all my contracts. 
I'm going to grab the electronics um, document. I'm going to pull it in. See right there, and now it's successfully uploaded. You can tell right here there's a file size limit of 50 megabytes. Um, I haven't had any agencies that have any larger than that, but if you do have a um, contract template or a contract document that's larger than 50 megs, um, we're going to have to do a workaround, whether we break it into two files or whatever, but there is an upload file size limit of 50 megs. Print send with contract. What this is telling me is, are you going to send this out for DocuSign? It's already signed, so I'm going to put no on that. Join vendor portal, I'm going to put no. And the summary visibility, we just leave it as the default. So when I click on Save Changes, it's taking that document as an attachment. You can see it's adding as an attachment here. Right here, it's designating this as the main contract template. That's what that crown means. So essentially, this is the signed contract of my active contract that I just uploaded. You have the ability, a different section, this internal only section, you can add internal attachments here. What I use this for, good example of is my insurance. So I'll go out and grab my insurance document. You can see right here, it's not asking me print send with contract because in the internal section, you can't send documents from this section out through DocuSign. You would never send an insurance document through DocuSign. You haven't found a need to, so it's okay to put your insurance documents in the internal only section. You guys can do it whatever way you want. I believe SPB puts all of their documents in this general section, so they have them all together. But you do have the ability to separate them out if you choose to do. Any of these other internal, this could be pricing files, it could be whatever else pertains to your contract that doesn't necessarily have to be signed by the contractor. You can actually put it in this section if you choose to. Obligations we'll talk about when we get to the obligation section. But um, I always try to put anything that pertains to this document, to this contract in here. Um, I don't like to go out to the S drive and look for something that's on the S drive that pertains to this when we can have all the attachments right here. So you have the ability, you have full control over this as the contract manager. Um, your stakeholders, which I'll show you later in the presentation, they can get to these, but they can't remove them. They can just open them up and view them. So you as a contract manager have full control over what attachments go in here. Questions on attachments? So what's going to happen here, too, is this when we go to do our contract renewal and our contract amendment, same thing, we're going to put the attachment here rather than here, is it will it'll need to go through DocuSign for signature. So I'll show you that when we go to do our renewal and our amendment. Obligations, I uh, talked to your contracts officer. Um, he currently doesn't have a need for this, but I'll just cover it briefly. You have the ability to add an obligation. What that is, is it could be, say, for example, you needed a report due at a certain time um, during the contract term. You could set up an obligation. we just show you really quick one time on contract date, due, next. You would add the owner to it, um, second party. This is like Kim. I would add myself to it as well. And then the advance notices, you could put however many advance notices. Basically, what's going to happen is based on 180 days advance of the start date, this, these people are going to get a obligation that's telling them, hey, a report is due. So I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. You guys can actually test it if you want. Um, but it does have the ability to send a, basically an obligation to either the contract manager or the vendor of something they're obligated to based on the contract. It sends them a, a warning. Say, hey, in 60 days, you know, this reports due. So this system is all email driven. So 
once you guys move to production, if you get a uh, email from the EMAX system, if you're getting it for a reason, you really should act on that email. Um, a lot of people just say, I don't even know what this is. I'm going to delete it. But it is all email driven. And you'll see in your testing that you'll get emails. And the reason you're getting an email is you have to perform some kind of action in the system based on that email. What happens here then, as soon as um, that vendor sends you whatever you, that report, you have the ability to come in here. You can mark this as complete. You can put a note in there. I'm going to add the report that he gave me. There's something in here. There's my report. I marked it as complete. It's now complete. Um, he sent me the attachment. So if I go back to the attachment section in the obligations, there's the report that he sent me. So that's what the obligation attachment section is for, is if you need some kind of report or some kind of document that the contractor or somebody's obligated to send you, you can use an obligation to um, get that from that, the actual contractor or that actual person. Um, you guys can test this. I, I know your CEO didn't think they'd had a, had a use for this, but the functionality is there. It's not required. You guys can use it. If you choose to use it, you can find a use for it. Questions on obligations. And the only thing I can tell you guys is that I would, I would thoroughly test this. Um, it's been my experience that that obligation, once it goes out to that contractor, Every day it sends them an email until he sends you what you want. So it, it can get annoying at times, but sometimes if that's the report you need and they're not sending it to you, a daily reminder would get old and they'll, as soon as they get it three days in a row, they'll send you what you need. But I encourage you to actually test that. Um, questions on this section before I move on? A review round. Again, this is a section that some agencies use, some people choose not to use. What this actually is for, it allows the contract manager to send the contract. Now, you wouldn't use this on an active contract, but new contracts, you would use this to send the contract to either legal or your contractor or whatever, so they can review the terms of what's contained in the contract. So it's not a, not an it's basically an approval, but it's an approval of the language that's in the existing contract. So since it's an active contract, you wouldn't use it, but essentially what you can do is it can create either an internal or an external. When you create an external one, it's people outside the system. They'll ask you to select somebody, so on and so forth. So I'll let you guys test this. I won't go into um, it very deeply, but you can add a reviewer, so on and so forth, but I'll let you guys test this. And then you actually begin the round when you enter all the information. Um, you also have the ability to, to do what's called an, in, or an internal round. And what that allows you to do is select somebody part of EMAX. So they have to be part of EMAX in order to get this, this uh, review round. You have to search for them. They have to be part of it and select them. They add the reviewer, oops, and then you actually begin the round. You send them a message. What happens now is this person's getting an email saying, you have an internal review, please log in, go to this contract record and look at the attachment section and let me know if you agree to that contract record. So again, it doesn't apply on active contracts, but I just wanted to show you um, briefly how it actually works. You can do internal, but they have to be part of EMAX, or you can do what's called external. They have to be, those are people outside the system. What happens is they get an email from the system to their email box. And then what happens in the communication center down here, it actually stores all the emails that go back and forth. But again, this doesn't apply to active contracts, but I, I, I allow you guys to test this so you can see if you have a use for it or not. To be honest with you, most people are just going to Outlook and sending it through Outlook that way. They're not using this uh, internal functionality, but it does help to keep a 
complete contract record if you do it within the system. So um, I'll just end this round now so we can get it out of that internal review. Now we're back to draft. So I'll let you guys test that again. It doesn't apply to an active contract, so we'll move on to the next step. Um, we're almost done with this, and then we'll take a quick break. It won't take me very long to go through all of this, but next we're to the submit for approval. You can actually submit this for approval and get it executed in effect, but I always want to show you guys the next section, what you should probably finish before you actually submit for approval. You can see here, this is the workflow that it actually goes through when you submit this contract. These are all automated steps. Compile robot is looking at your record. Signature robot is looking if it needs to go out to DocuSign. And then the status will be out for signature. And I'll show you what happens as soon as we finish this contract record. But it does have approval steps. The two of them are automated. The third one creates a manual process. And I'll show you how that actually works. Next section from e-procurement all the way down to PO clauses. Sections we don't actually use, too restrictive in our contract negotiation and our contract managing process. The only one that does apply, and I know your agency didn't have an interest in it, was just budget and spend. You do, we do have an integration with Sabres that um, if you get an invoice from this actual vendor, um, they can go into actual Sabres and on the voucher, they can select this contract. They would look for this contract number, and they look for the second party. They'd create the voucher. They'd make the payment. As soon as they do batch processing at night, that payment history comes over here, and it updates the voucher spend. So that's all I want to tell you about it. If you have the ability to track spend on your contract, it's not a requirement to use TCM. I believe your leadership is not interested in this functionality, but I just wanted to let you guys know it's there. It's a, a tool that a contract manager can use to see the value of his contract without actually going to his accounting tech and have them uh, run a report on Sabres. So we do have an integration with Sabres for this, but um, it doesn't apply to everybody, but that is the only section in this, from e-procurement down to PO clauses that would apply. I'll just click save changes there, but you can um, apply a budget. And if you enforce that budget, take advantage of the voucher and spend. If payment and savers goes over this budget, you actually get an email to the contract manager saying, hey, you're over your budget. Doesn't stop the payment from going out in savers. It's just another email notification to you as the contract manager saying, hey, you just went over your allowed budget on your contract. So um, I'll leave it at that. It's functionality that you guys currently aren't going to take advantage of. So um, we'll move on. But any questions on that part of it or anything else that I've covered so far? Okay, so we're going to skip down to the comments section. Comments allows you to put comments in here. It's almost like a uh, notepad. You know, you can put something in here. Um, And then you can actually send this notification to another person in your division. You just have to select them. They get notified that you put an actual note in here. Um, only the contract managers can see these notes. Um, your stakeholders won't be able to see it. Your vendors won't be able to see it. it not everybody uses this, but it, it, it's just almost like a little notepad or that you can um, enter comments based on what's going on with your contract record. Um, not required. You don't have to use it. But uh, some agencies put notes in here. They talked to the vendor or got the report from them or their insurance expired or whatever the case may be. But um, just a, a section that where you can put notes on the ma how you're managing your actual contract. Communication center. Again, you can do what's called an internal and an external communication. What happens with these is when you do an external communication, you can you – can, um, Talk to your vendor about your actual contract. What happens here is it brings this um, placeholders up. Put your contract number in here. You can put information in here that's to the vendor. Um, you can select your recipients who you want this to go out to. And 
Adams. And then you can add attachments to it as well. I'm going to send them this contract. So as soon as you create this, send this create, it's sending an email to this recipient showing them the contract. Just a way to communicate back and forth. Um, again, some agencies are going to Outlook. They're not really taking advantage of this um, functionality, but I encourage you guys to test it. You may have the ability to find a use for it. Um, Internal, again, and external, the difference between the two is internal, they have to be part of Emacs. They have to have a role in Emacs. External, they don't have to be part of Emacs at all. So a lot of people, vendor, or a lot of agencies are using this. Um, but I'll use attorneys, for example. Attorneys don't want to log in. They just want to open up their email and deal with that way. So they, some agencies are sending the external to their um, attorney. So the attorney doesn't have to log in and see anything. They can just open up their email. Once you start this communication externally, what happens is you can do the back and forth in your Outlook. You don't have to do it from the contract record. I send it to my attorney here. My attorney's going to go to his Outlook. He's going to get that email. He's going to respond back to me. That's going to my Outlook. Now we're in Outlook going back and forth. But the history of it is housed here. So it's kind of a cool tool. Um, I suggest you guys test that to see if it's if you want to use your uh, TCM contract record as a way to store your email communications on your contract. That's basically what it is. Any questions? We're almost finished here, and then we can take a quick break. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, uses and contacts. Real quickly, I'm the contract manager. I'm automatically listed as the contract manager because I created the contract. You have the ability to add co-contract managers. Not a whole lot of agencies do that. The risk involved there is one can be doing something on the record without the other one's knowledge. So if I was to make my coworker a contract manager, they could come in here, make some changes without my knowledge, but every section has what's called history. So this one doesn't have any. Let me go back to the header section. You can click on this history that can show you who did what and what time they did it and what they did. So um, if, you, if you have a coal contract manager and you come in here and you see something was changed, you can go to the history. And it'll tell you who exactly did it. So there's not a whole lot of agencies that do co contract managers. You guys have the ability to do it. Well, hopefully we're relying on communication. Hey, Tom, I'm going into contract 555. I'm going to update the insurance. Then he goes and does it. But you have the ability to do co-contract managers. Officers approvers does, does, doesn't apply. You can see co contract managers have full control over the contract. So if you add somebody here, they can do what you can do. Change attachments, change dates, delete attachments, so on and so forth. Your stakeholders, they only have view rights and receive notifications. So what STD does is we do some contracts on behalf of justice. We are the actual contract managers, but then the division people that actually do the daily management of that contract will add them as a stakeholder so they can search and actually see the contract in TCM, see all the attachments, see all the data, see the insurance, see whatever they need to see. So you have the ability to add stakeholders to your contracts as well. This user from work group, these are all the people that can actually see your contract. And state procurement is the parent work group for TCM. We have the ability to see and touch all your contracts. We don't touch your contracts. We have that ability. And the reason we have that is we do contracts on behalf of all agencies. So we have to have the ability enter contracts for all agencies. Um, if you made this confidential, you can see right here, make confidential. Now the users from all that group are zero. So you do have the ability to make contracts confidential. I can warn you, state of Montana is an open state. So if somebody asks for a contract, you know, we ask legal first, but because we're such an open state, we have to give them a copy of the contract. So not a whole lot of our contracts in here are confidential, but you do have the ability to do that. Visibility controls, 
I suggest leaving it at full. What that is, is actually shows you what your stakeholders can see. And I'll show you at the end what a stakeholder will actually see. An external contract. This is functionality where it would allow us to add the vendor to actually see this, but it's a resource issue. We don't have the, the, the actual staff to take advantage of this functionality. So essentially, we're not using this section because of that. It's, it's a administrative nightmare. We just don't have the resources to. Is what you have to do is you have to add all the external contacts to Emacs, and then you have to add them here. So administrative nightmare. We just don't have the staff to do it. So our external contacts, along with our dot design, once they sign a copy of that, sign that contract via dot design, they get a copy of it. So, and I'll show you how that works as well. So we don't actually use that section. So that's users and contacts. Last two sections real quickly, notifications. If you don't forget anything, I want you to remember this part because this helps you manage your contracts. This is one of the main reasons we went and got TCM. We manage so many contracts that we never know when's going to come due. We needed some kind of notification, some kind of system to help us manage them. That's what this is. You have contract managers, you have stakeholders, and you have external contacts. These are the notifications that can be applied. The example that we actually use is we select these four. We want an advance notice on the end date, end date passed, renewal date, renewal date passed. For the contract manager on the contract, which would be me, and we also would do it for the stakeholders on the contract. These four. I mean, you can, whatever applies to you guys, you can use whatever you want. I can tell you in this section, you don't want to mark it in the work group because what that is, that's agency. So if you mark it in the work group in both of these, those people that are underneath that as a role are going to get this notification and it doesn't have anything to do with them. So fair warning, make sure you select contract managers on the contract, stakeholders on the contract only. And down here, what you do, advance notices on the start date, you can put whatever advance notices you want. Some people use 90, 60, 30 on the end date and also on the renewal date. If you only want one notification, you would just put one in there. We just say changes there. So what this is doing now is this is helping me manage my contract. It is saying 90 days prior to the end date that's on that header going to send me a notification that you have 90 days and the contract's going to expire. Same with renewal. 90 days prior to the renewal date, this contract's going to expire. If you do not fill this out, you're not going to get these notifications. I've seen agencies forget this part, forget to fill it out, and all their, all their contracts expire without them even knowing. Unless you go in there and run a daily report, which you can do, but they have no way of knowing these expired because they didn't send up to receive any kind of notification. Then here we don't actually use. Um, so that's notifications. Let me just finish with contract family, and then we'll take a real quick break. Contract family, what we're going to see in this is this is showing all your contracts based on this contract number. So right now we're working on the original. Once we get the original executed in effect, then... We can come to the contract family. Every time we do a contract renewal, it's going to show you all of these. And I'll show you how that actually works. So essentially, we are done entering data in this. The last thing I want to show you is how we're going to get this contract executed in effect. Right now, it's in draft. You can see we have green check marks. Everything's green. We filled out everything. We're good to go. We come to the approvals. We're going to submit this for approval. This window doesn't apply. It's not required. You can send a message, but we don't have an approval workflow. I just mentioned it's automated. You can submit for approval. It's going to take you to a landing page that gives you a brief summary of what's going on here. Um, you have some options up here. The option you want to select is view the contract. You can see it's a different status now. It's out for signature. What had happened is 
It went through that approval workflow. Compile robot automatic completed. Signature robot automatic completed. This out for signature is just a status. I know it's an active contract, but it's not going through DocuSign. This is a manual process. In order to get this executed in effect, you have to go to the contract action. You're going to upload your fully executed contract. Now, if you use the correct PDF when you uploaded the contracts, you just select this and click Save Changes. I know I didn't. I uploaded a Word document, so I have to go back out there and grab my executed in effect contract. Just grab a PDF one here. I'm going to pull it in. This is the contract that's already signed. It applies to this contract record. Um, I'm going to click Save Changes. And right now, you can see the status has changed to Executed Future. Because this is a test environment, it's taken a while for it, to, for it to catch up. But it's waiting for this start date, which has already been passed. And there's an expiration date of tomorrow. So eventually, this contract record will be executed in effect. Test environment, it takes a little while. So um, see right now in my screenshot that this contract is now executed in effect. So um, in the production environment, it normally takes a little, or I mean, a test environment it normally takes a little while longer than production, but production is pretty much automatic. So um, the goal now is we've got to enter an active contract in there. I want to show you the renewal and the amendment process because in the, during the TCM implementation, um, that's a requirement to test those three before moving to production. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that those of the people that are back, if there's any questions on anything up to this point before I move on. Okay, so what I'm going to need to do here is I'm just going to go to a, the home screen here again to actually um, get rid of that contract record. So the next question that I get is people said, okay, Tom, I've entered my contracts. Now, how do I get to them? So I want to show you, we entered that one contract. I want to show you the, some of the searching features to get to the contracts after you actually enter them. So in, that, in this part of it, we're going to go to the contracts. We're going to go to the search contracts. You have two different searches. You have a uh, simple search where you can actually put the name, number, summary, it's active for shopping, starting end date, so on and so forth. This is very limited. Um, it's kind of tricky to get your actual contracts to show up. There's an easier way to actually do it. If you go to the advanced search, one of the main things that you can do is contract manager, you would just select me. And then if you click search, it's going to bring them all up, regardless of what status that they're actually in. That's the easiest way to do it. I have a bunch of contracts in here, so I don't want to actually do that. Um, you could do that. The other way that's really easy to do is look at the contract status. I only want to see the executed and effect ones. So I've got me as a contract manager that executed and effect. You notice that if I... Quick search here, I'm going to have a bunch of them. So I'm trying to narrow it down, trying to filter it down to the contracts that I just entered. I did remember, some people remember the contract number. I remember I put 555 in there, that that was the contract number. If I knew the name, I could do the name, so on and so forth. You can expand all these fields, and you can put any data in here to try to get to your contracts. You know, we talked about commodity codes. There's a commodity code field in here. Category code, you can put that category code field in there to get to those contracts that have that particular category code applied. We had those um, ones that were used just for agencies. You can put data in any one of these fields, and actually here it is right here, agency contract one, agency contract two, whatever, you put admin fee in there and bring it up that way. So there's all kinds of filters that you can actually use to search most people are good at numbers. Most people are good at names. Most people aren't good at any one of those, but you have all kinds of filters to put on there. So I'm just, I know for a fact that contract number is 555. I know it's executed in effect, and I know that it's me. So I'm going to click search. 
And there's my actual contract. Again, I'll go back to that. Search again, the easiest way for you to find yours would be me as a contract manager. Then when you click search, it's going to bring them all up to as well. So that would be the easiest way to find them. One of the fields that might prohibit you from getting your results is this active for shopping. I think the default is active. When you do that, you want to change it to all, and that will be the default moving forward. So if you do contract manager me, active shopping all, click search, it'll get you back to your contracts. And I'm going to put this number in here to get back to my actual contract. And there it actually is. So that search feature, powerful. You can search by all kinds of data, and it's all the data that we entered on this actual contract. Um, again, some people are good with numbers. You can actually go to a vendor. Go to this thing. Close this. You can go to this vendor and search for a vendor. Oops. Some people are good at, at knowing the vendor's name. When you go into the actual vendor profile, come over here to legal and compliance, and you can click on contracts and get to them that way too. Obviously, they have a bunch, but that's another option as well if you want. If you know the vendor, you can get to your contract as well. So the, the very, very powerful tool you can see right there, there's my contract. Very, very powerful search engine to get to your actual contracts. So I'm back into this contract. I want to make sure nobody has any questions at that point, because now what I want to do is I want to show you how to do the amendment and the renewal process. It goes a lot quicker. You have a lot of the data already entered. You're just going to change what's in the renewal or what's in the amendment, and we're going to throw, I'm going to show you the DocuSign process. So before I do that, I'll stop there. Is there any questions on that? Okay, so I'll move forward. So what I want to discuss real quickly here is amendment renewal. Before the system even came along, an amendment renewal outside the system is essentially the same thing. You're amending the contract, and you may be changing the dates to the renewal date. So up until before the system came along, amend, amendment and, process and renewal meant the same thing. In the system, there are actually two different things. So an amendment, you could do an amendment to this contract record, which I'm going to show you what that is. We're changing something within the contract record other than the starting and end dates. Could be the how much the contract is worth. Could be, I don't know, I'll, I'll, anything, but anything within the contract record. In these custom contract fields, you could be changing something. Okay, um, what it's worth. Um, not necessarily dates, because that has to do with renewals. Um, maybe the contract usage type changed. Something changed within this contract record. So we have to do an amendment, and we have to have both sides, the state and the vendor, sign that. So what we do is we navigate to the actual contract record. First thing we're going to do before we do any of that is we're going to um, have an amendment made up. So we're going to go to... Uh, an amendment, this is an example of one, and we're gonna create, oops, right here. We're gonna create the amendment, Word document, turn it into a PDF and save it. So this is an example of the amendments that STB uses. They would fill this out, contract number, so on and so forth, enter what's going to be changed on it and save it as a Word document. You can see down below here, it has signature tags. So this is what STB does is they're going to amend the contract, they come to this record, they fill it out, they save it electronically, and we're going to use this as an example to do the amendment on our contract record. So that's the first thing they've done is they've, we've done the actual amendment. Now we come to the actual contract record, we're going to come to the contract actions items, and you can see we have the ability to amend or renew. So let's do an amendment first. We're going to click on amend. What the system is doing now, it's saying, do you want to include the latest attachment versions? Always select yes here. As all of your attachments from previous records come over to the one that's executed in effect. You don't have to go search for them. 
The default is no on here, but make sure you select yes to bring all the latest attachments over to this new contract record. When you select yes, that's creating a record that's called an amendment to the original record. You can see right here, now we're in an amendment. There's an amendment here, shows an amendment here. Whoops. So we're in an actual amendment record. It shows an amendment here as well. I can tell now is if you go to the contract family, you can see that we have our original and we have our amendment. Now we have two records. Well, essentially what's going to happen is as soon as this amendment becomes executed in effect, this original becomes superseded because now we have a new record. So the first thing that we've done is we've saved the amendment as a PDF document electronically. We've come in here. We've selected the amendment process from the dropdown. We're in the amendment record. Next thing you want to do is I'm going to go make the change in here. Um, change on the amendment for, say, the funding source went from state to federal. You're going to change that and click Save Progress. Also, ask and ask me for an 899. I'm going to say no there. Okay, so I've made the change on the contract record. The other thing I have to do is I have to go to the attachment section and I have to add that amendment record as an attachment. So I'm going to go to that amendment record. I'm going to pull that amendment record in. uploaded. Print send with contract. You want to say yes, because now this is going through DocuSign. So we'll leave this as last. I'll click Save Changes. You can see this renewal template has come in. Print send with contract is marked to yes. It's going through DocuSign. Now, the other thing that's happened here is the previous executed contract that we uploaded came over from an, another record. Now it's located here. We don't want that one to go through DocuSign, so we edit the properties and we change that to no. Okay, so we've made the change on the contract record. We've uploaded the renewal amendment that's going to go through DocuSign. One last thing we have to do is, remember we talked about it back on the header section, the default on this is no. We're going to do it, yes, because now it needs to be signed. So it's going through e-signature. So we change that to yes. Click Save Changes. And you see over here, now the e-signature sections come up. Now we're going to add our signers. Who needs to sign this actual amendment? Two ways to do it. You can select it from the contract party. So on and so forth. Or you can manually enter. I'll just grab somebody that I did before. You can add as many signers as you actually want. We'll do two of them here. And as you can see, they're putting them in signing order. One goes first, two, so on and so forth. You can have as many as you want. There's no limit on how many people can actually sign through DocuSign. The amend record is going to show how many signatures you actually need. I'm just going to use these two just to show it how you actually work. So what's required in it is a name and an email address. Questions so far? That's essentially what you need to do to the amendment record to get it ready to go to through DocuSign. You have to make the change in the record. You have to compile the amendment and save it electronically. You have to add it as an attachment, and then you have to add the signers. Questions so far? Okay. So the next thing we got to do is submit this for approval and see the approval steps right here right now. You can see there's an additional step. The active contracts have the compile robot, signature robot, and the out for signature. Now we're going through DocuSign. There's another step in here called the e-signature setup step, and I'll show you what 
happens there. So we've got everything ready. Got the document, got the doctor signed. It's marked to go out to the doctor sign. So I'm going to submit this for approval, just like we did last time. Um, it's going to land us on a page that's the general summary page. Same thing that we did with our active contract. We're going to go back and view the contract. You can see the status has changed. It's pending approval. I always make a note to go to the approval section because we make it go through these sections. So it's already completed this run. It's already completed this one. When it hits the e-signature setup, that's telling you, okay, I've got to set up e-signature now in DocuSign. So I go to the amendment actions. I launch e-signature. What's going to happen? It's going to take this document. It's going to pull it into DocuSign. Now we're in the DocuSign application. We have an integration with DocuSign. Here's my amendment record. This is the amendment that I uploaded into TCM. You can see it has signature tags. So the process that we're going to use now is we're going to get these people to sign this contract in whatever sections they need to sign. And here's the process on how you do it. You can see right here, it's currently on Jason Day. So Jason Day, I would grab his signature. Jason Day is going to sign here. And we're going to have the date signed here. Next, we go up to I only had two signers. I'm going to select this first signer. It's all color-coded. He's going to sign here. And we're going to date it here. You do that for as many signers as you had. I only had two. I could have added a third, or a third one and have the contractor actually do it. But you can see they're all color-coded. So we're adding the tag, and we're adding the date that it's signed. The other thing that you can do here is some people want copies of contracts. DocuSign allows you to add recipients of the signed contract. Those users that are signing it will automatically get a copy when it's executed. Sometimes you have stakeholders that need to have a copy of this contract. So you can come up here and go to Edit Recipients. You can see those two have already added. I'm going to add a recipient. I'll just put this in there. I uh, better change it. Change this email to something else. And you see it over here, rather than needs to sign, I would select receive the copy. You can add as many recipients to receive a copy too. So what's going to happen with this one? I'm going to go to Jason Day first. He's going to sign it. Then as soon as he's done, it's going to go to this next person. And as soon as he's done, going to send a copy to all three of these people because these two people signed it and this person wants to receive a copy. Add as many as you want. Then you click done. As soon as you've got all your tags, all your recipients, over here in this corner, you want to click send. And now what happens is those two people are getting an email from DocuSign to actually sign this contract. And I apologize for production or for test. It takes a while for this to get caught up. So I'll stop right there. Does anybody have any questions? Where where people get confused is this approval section. Is it's got that extra step? But as you can see, what's it, what's going to happen eventually is this pending signature will be updated to out for signature because that's where it is. It's just the test environment takes a while to catch up. So um, but it's What's happening behind the scenes is these people, you can see now it's out for signature. So it's set up. You have the ability to come to your contract and click on this little icon. It'll give you an update of where your contracts are at. What I find is agencies get to this point and then they forget about it. They move on with their lives. Well, you still got to make sure that these people actually sign it. So, Make a habit of searching for your out for signature contracts, going to the signature and see where they're at. It tells you where they're at. Right now, it's got sent to this particular signer at this time. And status, he still hasn't signed it yet. 
waiting for him to sign it. Any questions on that? Hey, here's what the email actually looks like. Um, it looks like it's a better in, in the production environment because this is the demo environment. So the email comes in. The user clicks on the actual document. There. Brings the document up. They can click on the start button. It'll take them right to where they need to sign. They click sign. They use the save signature, and then they click finish. And now they're actually done signing. So eventually back here in the signature section, when it gets caught up, this will be updated to completed. Again, this test environment is going to take a while. But you have the ability to see where it is at any time. The other thing that you have the ability to, to do is hopefully you're in communication with these signers and they say, hey, you know what happened? Maybe this first signer calls, say, hey, you know, Tom, I didn't get that email. Can you send it to me again? That's what this resend reminder email is. You click on that. It'll send wherever the document is to what signer. It'll send them a new email with a new link to sign it again. Any questions on that process? And I encourage you guys, get in the test environment and test this. Please be sure you, you know, send emails to coworkers rather than to live contractors because they'll get confused if they get a document to sign and it's not a true contract. So I'll stop right there. I'll open it up for anybody who has any questions at all whatsoever on this process? Either I'm good or I'm boring, but again, I hope you'll have questions you know, after you guys test this. But as you can see now, this is caught up. This is actually shows this vendor has completed this process. You can see the day it got sent, the day it got viewed, and the day it got signed. Right now, it's sending an email to this person to do the same actual thing. But say this first signer gets a hold of you and said, well, Tom, I didn't see that email. You have the ability to resend the reminder email. Click on that button. You can see right here, reminder email successfully sent. So it's going to send it to him again. So you have the ability to do that on your contracts. You just want to make sure you have a communication with that person because if you send it without them knowing that you resend it, they're going to get two emails and one's going to work and one's not going to work. So they're going to get confused. So you always want to reach out to your signer and say, hey, you know, did you receive that uh, DocuSign email? I need you to sign this contract. They say no. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to send you another one. If they go into the original one and they click on the link, it's not going to be any good because you sent them a new one. So communication is key when it comes to this. You want to make sure that you're communicating with um, those actual vendors before you actually send it out to them again. Here's the other one. Same thing. They open it up in DocuSign. They have to agree to these records. But continue. If you click start, it'll take you where they actually have to sign. Same thing. They finish just like the other guy finished. They're done signing. And if you come back to our contract record, eventually this will be completed and the contract record will be executed in effect. You'll be able to come to the contract family and actually see them both. Eventually, this original will be superseded, and this amendment will be executed in effect. That's the amendment process. Any questions at all on that while we're waiting for this to get caught up? Um, 
that's the amendment process. Um, it goes through DocuSign. It's again, it's what we try to do is we try to conserve uh, the DocuSign envelopes that we use. Sometimes agencies will enter this C signature and they'll they'll get it to where oh they made a mistake here and it's already out in DocuSign. We ask that you get a hold of the help desk. We go in and try to make the change behind the scenes because DocuSign charges us every time we create an envelope, there's a charge for that. Now, we don't charge agencies for that, but if there's a mistake on an envelope, rather than returning this whole thing back to draft and starting over, we as system administrators can go into DocuSign and change an email from something to something else to try to preserve that envelope. That's something that we discuss you know, when we move you to production. I, I, that's a, a move to production topic that we discuss. So we, I'll show you how to enter a ServiceNow ticket so you can um, have the help desk help you make a change on a DocuSign envelope. See, this one's completed now as well. What's going on now is those two people have got copies of it along with the recipients. They've got an email with a copy of it. Contract family, you can see the original is now superseded, and the uh, amendment is the one executed in effect. You can get to either one by clicking on this and going to that contract. So it's nice that you can go to one version, get to the other version, whatever other version that you want. And if you go to your attachment section up above here, you'll see that this file is the one that's and sent through and been signed. So it shows they, they signed it, so now your contract's executed in effect. Any questions? No questions at all. Okay, well, the next thing I want to do is I want to show you how to do an actual renewal on this. Um, almost the same process, just a little different click. Let's cover the renewal process, and then we'll think about taking a break. And then the last part of this will be me showing you how to do some reports, um, how to search for contracts, how to archive contracts, how to close out contracts. Um, let's show the renewal process on this contract first here real quick. So, again, first thing you actually want to do is get your renewal document ready. Let's close this. And use the same one. So what we'll do here is we'll go to this execute and set contract. You can see right now in the contract family, we have an original that we did and we have an amendment that we did. So normally in the header section, you can see this is only good till tomorrow, 1229. So we like to get the renewals, which is what a renewal does, is it's renewing it for another term. So the renewal here is a year, so it's going to expire tomorrow. We're going to do a renewal. The new starting date will be 1229-2022, ending date will be a year later, 2023. So again, outside of this system, you have the, the renewal document already ready. You've already compiled that because you're going to renew this document. You already find out who's going to sign it. So in the system, you're going to come to contract actions. Rather than amend, we're going to do renew now. I'm going to click renewal. It tells you renewals, replace the original contract, and retain the same contract number. You sure you want to create a renewal. Just gives you that warning. We say yes. Going to create it. Now you can see we are in a renewal. We are in draft in a renewal. You go down here to the contract family. You're going to see three dot three. There's the original. There's the amendment. And there's the renewal. You can see right here, the starting and end dates have changed on the renewal. 
The amendment shows 12 one 2022 to 12 29. The renewal is 12 30 to 12 29 23. So we're going to, the renewal, that's what happens when you select a renewal. It automatically updates the starting and end date based on what you have in the header. So the system already did it for us. See over here, now we have five renewals remaining. That used to be six, now it has five. So it updated the dates and it updated the renewals. So all we have to do now is, you can see right here, the e-signature section is set to yes. We go to our attachment section. We're going to change this. No, because we're going to up, up load our renewal now. We're going to have people sign. We go to that file. Select the renewal. Make sure it's yes. Normally, you wouldn't upload the same document, so I'm just going to change the name of it. Now, there's our renewal document. It's marked to go out for DocuSign. So we have it in the attachment section. We have e-signature turned on. We go to e-signature. It could be the same users. You could delete them or add them. Add another one. We'll just leave them the same, but you would add your signers. Everything else is done, then all you have to do is get it through the process again. We're going to go to submit for approval and see you still have those workflow steps. We're going to go and submit this. It's going to land us on a page, summary page, just like we did last time. We're going to go to view the contract and see it's pending approval. Go to the approval section. Have to wait for them to automate through this workflow step. And again, test takes a little while, but as soon as it goes through these workflow steps, we're going to send it through DocuSign, and then we'll have our renewal complete. So while we're waiting on that, is there any questions? Okay, so as you see here, the first two steps are done. Going up here, we're going to launch e-signature again. We're going to pull up our document. Our document for our renewal. Same thing, we're going to go to the signer section. We're going to have Jason Day sign here. It's all the same process. Uh, first signer, sign here. Again, we can add recipients if we want to. Right now it's only those two, but again, you can do the same thing with the renewal. I'm not going to add any here just to save some time, but then you would click send. And right now it is sending, just like it did last time, it's sending an email to both of these people to actually sign it. Once they sign it, they'll do the same thing. Um, this will get updated to for signature. They'll sign it. It'll eventually get updated to execute it in effect. And then down here, we will have three different ones. This one will be superseded and your renewal will be the one that's executed in effect. So the amendment and renewal, same process to go through DocuSign. Just two different documents, two different clicks. One's a renewal, will automatically update your starting and end dates. The other one's an amendment, where it won't update the starting and end dates. You'll make the change in the record, put it in the document, and have it signed to DocuSign. Any questions? I know that's a lot. <laughs> I encourage you guys to test this because. As soon as you do it two or three times, then it's, it becomes automatic. I mean, you'll know exactly what to do. But yes, there is some manual processes. You can see we're out for signature now. Eventually, we're waiting for these two people to sign it. Um, as soon as they sign it, it'll be executed in effect.
I'll see if I can get him signed. But in the meantime, is there any questions? Here's the first signer, just like they did last time. Opens up in DocuSign. Same thing. Start. Sign. Saved. Finish. So it's all the same thing. Let me do the other one here real quick. Oh, that one's complete. Still waiting for the one on the other one, so. Same thing, agree, continue, start, sign. So eventually this will update, both complete, both complete, and eventually it will be executed in effect. And it catches up, so then we'll have the renewal be executed in effect. The amendment will be superseded along with the original. But they're all right here. You can get to each one of the records by clicking on that and going to the contract. Questions? No questions at all. Okay, so I think we can finish within the next 30 minutes, so I'll just keep going. The only thing I want to cover now is um, reporting um, and how you search for your contracts. We'll do that again, and how you can archive and close out contracts, so on and so forth. So let me just do this real quick. Open this gets might take a while for that to do. Well, the reason it going to take a while for this is because this has a starting date of tomorrow or the 30th. So that's why it's not executed in effect yet. Um, the 30th, this record will be executed in effect and the other ones in the contract family, this will be superseded. So sometimes people don't want to see all of these at one time. They don't care that one's superseded. You have the ability to archive records. We'll go into this one. It's just another contract action. You can just click archive. And you can see that this contract is archived, can no longer be used. So what happens in the contract family, it just shows that one of the contracts was archived. You do have the ability to go back to it and unarchive it as well. And then when you come back to the contract family, it comes back. So some people don't like to see all the records. Some people do. You have the ability to archive, so they only see those ones that are actually in effect. So you have the ability to archive. As soon as these actually go through their full term, you do have the ability to come up here, and there's going to be an option to complete it. So these aren't complete, so I can't show you that, but that's another um, action item on your contracts. As soon as they went their full term, they'll eventually expire and you have the ability to go up here and complete them out. So when you complete your contracts, state procurement has a um, uh, process where they, you need to upload your, your current contract closeout form when you close them out. But that's a process that you know, we can cover. You guys will cover in your actually testing environment, it's something I can't show, but you do have the ability to close out your, and, close out and, and archive your contracts as well. Reporting, again, I told you about reporting. There's this reporting, which um, the best reporting is contained in the actual contracts, reports. A um, bunch of things you can actually do here. The one I like is workload by contract manager. Um, you can search for yourself, like yourself, run a report. This right here tells me 
how many contracts I have and in what status. It's really actually kind of cool. You can see I have 134 in draft, two that are in this status. I mean, it tells me all the contracts that I've entered and what status they're actually in. I can click on this number. It'll bring me to those actual contracts. I can click on the contract number. It'll allow me to go into the actual contract. Not mine. Oh, that's a demo one. But it gives you the, it gives the, I can go into the actual contract. That's one reporting tool that's kind of cool. It's called workload by contract manager. The other one is you can run reports of expiring contracts. There you go. Bunch of options here. Contracts ending, whatever date range you can put in there. Only my contracts. You can do an amended, whatever renewal amendment status and how many remaining. I'm just going to leave here and see if this comes up with anything. Two little graphs down in the bottom. According to this, I have what contracts that's going to expire in the next 30 days. So that's the report that you can do as well. Those are the built-in canned reports. The other thing you can do, we talked about searching for contracts. Um, me, I'm going to do create date in the last seven days. And search for that. It's going to bring up all those contracts. You do have the ability to export this search into an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can share that spreadsheet. So the searching um, functionality, very, very powerful. You can almost search on, I showed you before, if we started this all over, you can search on any one of these fields in here. Very, very, very powerful. You got to be careful that you know, you'll put some incorrect data in one of these fields because then you're not going to get the results you're looking for. So, again, the easiest one is me, maybe select a contract status, execute it in effect, and be sure that, you know, this shopping thing is to all, active shopping is all. Just see what it gives me here. I'm sure there's going to be a bunch for me. As you can see, I have 26 of them that are executed in effect. So searching features, very powerful. It gets you where you want to be. You do have the ability to do save searches. I can save this search, go back to it if I want to go back to it. That's a little higher level once you guys get your contracts in there. You know, we can, we can teach that in another class, but um, I just wanted to do the basics on how you would enter a contract. And once you get all your contracts in there, then we can take the next step as far as you know, maybe setting up what's called a, a dashboard. Let me just show an example of that. This is a dashboard that in the test environment that I set up for myself. I have my contracts. I have my solicitations. I have my sole sources. I have my solicitation requests all on one page. So as you guys get deeper into your implementation, we can set up training classes where I can set this all up. You can have all of your contracts right at your fingertips. You don't have to, you know, go into contracts and search for them. You can just do it right from what this is called is a personal dashboard. And we can show you guys how to do that as well. When you get deeper and deeper into entering your contracts into TCM.